So, we uh, saw the uh, open field water heater and um, uh, we mentioned the fact that the um, the streams uh, that come into the uh, field water open field water heater and the stream that exits are all at the same pressure. In fact, the uh, field water heater operates at the extraction pressure of the um, from the turbine. Okay. So, the fluid that uh, enters the feed water here, the feed water that enters the heater and the extracted stream are at the same pressure and the feed water that leaves the uh, heater afterwards is also at the same pressure. So, this is a requirement because all these are being, uh, I mean the streams are being mixed uh, physically in the feed water heater. Now, in contrast in the closed feed water heater, the pressure um, of the different streams can be different from each other. Okay. So, here uh, we are showing a closed uh, feed water heater. So, as uh, before the uh, part of the steam is extracted from the turbine at uh, extraction pressure. Okay. So, this would be at the extraction pressure. Now, you may notice that the um, uh, feed water that enters the uh, feed water heater is at the same pressure as the boiler pressure, not the extraction pressure, but the boiler pressure. So, it actually goes through in a separate path and uh, never mixes with the steam from the uh, turbine that has been extracted from the turbine. So, it can be at a different pressure. So, it is usually at the boiler pressure whereas, the steam that enters the feed water heater is at the extraction pressure. So, the feed water as it moves through the, um, uh, through the heater is uh, heated by the steam that enters here and as the steam uh, transfers its enthalpy to the feed water condensers and there is a condensate or a saturated liquid at the bottom of the feed water heater. Now, there are two strategies uh, that are available for handling the uh, saturated liquid uh, condensate at the bottom of the feed water heater. One is to throttle it to the condenser pressure and send it to the condenser itself or uh, pump this condensate using a pump to the boiler pressure and then uh, send it to the boiler along with the feed water heat uh, along with the feed water that exits from the feed water heater. Okay. So, one strategy is to throttle it send it to the condenser where it is again pumped to the uh, boiler pressure, but sent to uh, sent through the feed water heater. The other strategy is to pump it separately using another pump and then send it to the boiler directly. So, as you can see since the streams are never mixed, the uh, streams can be at different pressures and they are usually at uh, different pressures. Okay. So, the uh, TS diagram of uh, Rankine cycle with a closed feed water heater looks like this. So, we extract part of the, st uh, part of the steam from the turbine and this is sent to the uh, uh, feed water heater. So, depending upon whether the uh, condensate is throttled and sent back to the condenser or whether it is uh, pumped directly to the boiler, we have either 1 minus x kg per second or 1 kg per second in this part of the cycle. So, the pump then pumps this to the boiler pressure and it then uh, traverses through the uh, uh, through the closed feed water heater where it is heated to uh, higher temperature corresponding to state 6 and then it is sent to the boiler. So, further heat addition takes place from uh, state 6 to state uh, state 1 in the boiler. Now, in case um, the condensate is pumped uh, separately to the boiler pressure there is additional uh, heat that is going to be transferred uh, to take the uh, feed water from state 8 s to state 1. Okay. So, depending upon how this is handled uh, the amount of uh, feed water that is pumped in this pump is can be 1 kg per second or 1 minus x kg per second. So, we can either have two pumps or one pump and different designs utilize um, uh, I mean different plants utilize you know different designs, but both are equally uh, effective and basically the uh, uh, the closed feed water heater has almost a, a same uh, sort of performance as the open heat water uh, as the open feed water heater when it comes to overall performance parameters of the cycle. 
Now, um, I have not really worked out an example involving the closed feed water heater here, uh, primarily for uh, sake of brevity, uh, but the textbook has a work, worked example uh, with the closed feed water heater and uh, those who are interested are urged to consult the textbook and work out the example that is given there. Whether it is a closed uh, feed water or open feed water heater, regenerative feed water heating definitely results in an improvement of the thermal efficiency. However, this comes with a price and that is a reduction in the uh, specific work output okay, or net work output whichever uh, one you want to look at. Okay. If it is net work output that you are thinking of, then we can simply uh, uh, address this issue by increasing the mass flow rate. So, if the uh, net work goes down by a certain amount, we adjust the mass flow rate, we increase the mass flow rate so that you know the net work is whatever we want it to be. The downside of this strategy is that you know the equipment size will have to increase now to accommodate the increased mass flow rate and that is generally not desirable. So, what we would like to do is retain the advantages of regenerative feed water heating namely increase in thermal efficiency of the cycle, increase in a second law efficiency of the cycle, uh, but address the shortcoming which is reduction in the power output. Okay. This can be addressed uh, or this is usually addressed in practical applications by resorting to uh, reheating of the steam. Okay. So, this addresses the shortcoming that we have with regenerative feed water heating and we will take a look at this next. So, what is done here is the following. So, in, um, uh, in, regenerative heat, uh, in regenerative feed water heating whether closed or open we had uh, the uh, we had the same setup basically we had a single turbine and steam was extracted uh, partially from the turbine. So, you can see that steam was extracted uh, from the turbine uh, before some of the steam is extracted from the turbine before it undergoes full expansion. So, the same is done in uh, closed feed water heating also <coughs> as you can see here. But when reheat is incorporated what is generally done is that rather than extracting uh, part of the steam. Uh, from the turbine, the turbine itself is split into two parts. Okay. So, we have one turbine that uh, that is like this okay. and the stream that comes out of this is partly sent to the feed water heater. The rest of the steam is taken to the boiler where it is reheated and then sent to another turbine which would look something like this. Okay. So, the first turbine is usually called a high pressure turbine and the second turbine is usually called a low pressure turbine for obvious reasons because the pressure at entry to uh, this turbine is the boiler pressure which is quite high whereas the pressure at entry to the low pressure turbine is uh, less than the boiler pressure because the steam has already undergone expansion in the high pressure turbine. So, that is the major difference that you see in the uh, expansion site in the cycle when reheat is incorporated. So, you can see that the steam expands entirely from the boiler pressure to uh, an intermediate pressure. So, this is the boiler pressure and this is the condenser pressure. So, what we used to call extraction pressure is now called an intermediate pressure. So, the steam is expanded in the high pressure turbine uh, up to the intermediate pressure. Then part of the steam is extracted and uh, sent to the feed water heater. The rest of the steam is then sent to the boiler where we have a heat addition process from 2S to 3. So, heat is added and the temperature of the uh, steam then increases. Usually, the temperature is increased up to the same temperature as uh, state bond typically although we have not shown it that way in this illustration typically that is what is done. And then the steam is sent to a low pressure turbine where it undergoes further expansion up to the condenser pressure. And the cycle is then the same as open. Uh, so, what we have shown here is a reheat with open uh, feed water heater.
So, this additional uh, heat supply in the boiler uh, should increase the work output when the steam undergoes further expansion in the low pressure turbine. So, the idea is we keep all the uh, beneficial aspects of regenerative feed water heating while also addressing the shortcoming which is a reduction in the uh, in the power output or specific power output. Notice that uh, this strategy does not require a higher mass flow rate of steam. The total mass flow rate of steam still remains the same 1 kg per second. However, the power is improved. So, specific power improves here not just net power, but specific power becomes better. Okay? So, the um, uh, size of the equipment need not change. So, that is the advantage to reheat. So, um, we will redo the previous example with one reheat stage where the steam is heated to the same temperature as in the high pressure turbine entry. Okay? So, that means that uh, state 3 temperature at state 3 T3 equal to T1 in this example. Okay? So, state 1 uh, same as before. A state uh, 2s also same as before because we use the uh, same pressure uh, for extracting that steam. Now, uh, 2s to 3 is heat addition. So, this is the reheat. So, this is the high pressure turbine. So, this is reheat and 4s to 5 is in the I am sorry uh, 3 to 4s is the low pressure expansion in the low pressure turbine. So, this is at the condenser exit. So, this is a saturated liquid uh, as before. This is a compressed liquid state. So, I have not uh, really given the details of how these property values have been worked out. I leave that as an exercise um, uh, to you to work out. In fact, it is advisable uh, in all the worked examples for you to actually uh, work out the uh, problem by yourself and then check your answers and wherever there are discrepancies, you can actually look at the procedure and then see uh, where you have made a mistake. Okay? So, I uh, strongly urge you to uh, do that. Pause the recording, record the problem on your own and then come back and compare the answers. Okay, so, this is uh, saturated liquid at the exit to the open feed water heater. So, this is compressed liquid at entry to the boiler. So, now we can uh, uh, repeat the calculation. So, heat supplied. Now, heat is supplied at um, uh, two different locations. One, uh, the feed water in the uh, boiler, number one. Number two, the reheat uh, steam in the boiler. So, these are the uh, two um, uh, places or parts in the cycle where heat is added. And you may recall that X was uh, evaluated to be equal to 0.313 in the previous example. Let us just uh, uh, quickly go back and check that. So, x was worked out to be 0.313. So, the heat added now uh, is 2728.44, much higher than before. Okay? So, without reheat, uh, heat supplied was 2363. Now, it is 2728. Okay. Heat rejected is 1447. Again, heat rejected is also more than before. Let us just uh, quickly go back and check. So, heat rejected was uh, 1284. Now, it is 1447. And the uh, work produced by the turbines, now we have HPT, high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. So, the work produced by the turbine is 1298.7 kilojoule per kilogram compared to 1096 kilojoule per kilogram uh, without reheat. Work supplied to the pump, uh, same as before because we are using the same open feed water heater. So, the net power generated is 1280. Uh, 9 kilowatts per unit mass flow rate of steam, which is higher than what we had before definitely. So, the thermal efficiency now as you can see is about 47 percent. And so, we have managed to retain the um, uh, benefits of higher thermal efficiency. We will also check the uh, second law efficiency, but the power output definitely is uh, higher now compared to before as we expected. And 
not only is the power output uh, more, notice that the specific power output has increased. This means that there is no change in the sizing of the equipment that is very important. So, we may calculate rate at which exergy is supplied to be 1770. Remember, uh, this QH dot includes uh, the initial heat that is added to the feed water plus heat added in the reheat part of the cycle. The rate at which heat uh, exergy is recovered comes out to be 1389 and the second law efficiency is 78.51 percentage. So, uh, addition of reheat to uh, the regeneration cycle has now addressed all uh, the deficiencies in the cycle. So, we have a very good cycle now. Reheat with open or closed uh, regenerative feed water heating. Okay. Now, uh, second law efficiency still continues to be high even though we have another stage of heat because the temperature uh, at entry uh, to the boiler is, uh, uh, is quite high because of feed water heating and the temperature at entry to the reheat uh, section of the boiler is also high because uh, state 2 is, is also at a reasonably high pressure. So, the exergy destruction due to uh, heat transfer across a finite temperature difference in the boiler is less because the temperature at entry to the boiler both uh, state 8 s and state 2 s are reasonably high. So, now if we compare uh, all the, uh, the results from all the variations that we have uh, done so far in the cycle. So, the basic cycle uh, had uh, performance parameters like this thermal efficiency 38 percent, second law efficiency 81 percent. Remember uh, these cycles are all operating between the same boiler pressure and the same condenser pressure. It is very important. So, we are making a uh, fair comparison. And the degree of superheat in all these cycles is the same. Okay. So, addition of superheat improved the thermal efficiency, improved the uh, specific work, but reduced the uh, but reduced the second law efficiency. So, let us uh, let me uh, show this in uh, green to indicate that this is this is a good thing. So, this is a good thing, it improved this, it improved this, but reduced the second law efficiency. Now, uh, regenerative heating, whether it is open or uh, closed feed water, uh, resulted in thermal efficiency becoming higher. So, this uh, was higher. And the second law efficiency also improved because the rate of exergy uh, destruction in the boiler was brought down. However, you can see that the specific power output uh, decreased uh, as a result of this. So, this came down and this was then addressed with uh, reheat, uh, one stage of reheat. So, the uh, one stage of reheat improved the overall thermal efficiency, it also improved the second law efficiency, it also improved the specific power output. In a typical uh, thermal power plant, it is customary to have uh, 2 or 3 feed water heaters and uh, between 2 and 3 reheat stages depending on the peak pressure and peak temperature in the cycle, usually depending on the peak pressure in the cycle and that is what we will uh, see now. So, what we want to uh, see now is how well this translates to the real uh, application which is actual uh, power plant that are in use today. Okay, let us take a look at that. So, here uh, we are looking at uh, uh, 1 uh, gigawatt uh, thermal power station. So, as you can see uh, this consumes 12,000 tons of coal a day and uh, about 98 million liters of water a day. Okay, which actually would be the drinking water supply for a moderately sized city. Okay. So, it produces although it is rated 1000 megawatts, uh, the electrical power output is around 920 megawatts with 80 megawatts going back uh, to the plant itself for uh, other needs. Uh, distressingly, it produces uh, 4200 tons of ash a day 
typical uh, numbers and uh, 30,000 tons a day of CO2 and 680 tons of uh, SOX and NOx per day. Okay, what is the uh, layout for this uh, plant look like? So, you can uh, see the boiler here and uh, other arrangements. So, if you uh, look at this, you notice that there are three turbines instead of two that we had shown. We have a high pressure turbine, we have an intermediate pressure turbine and we have a low pressure turbine. Okay. And you can see uh, the condenser which we uh, looked at earlier. You can see, um, uh, you can look at one feed water heater and another feed water heater here. So, this uses two feed water heaters. There is also an additional component here known as D aerator. Okay. Now, you may recall that um, uh, we uh, for, all, for all the examples that we worked out, we said that the condenser was operating at a temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. And you know very well that the saturation pressure corresponding to 100 degrees Celsius is uh, 100 kilo Pascal or atmospheric pressure. So, that means the saturation pressure corresponding to 45 degrees Celsius is less than the uh, ambient pressure. That means, the condenser actually operates uh, in a vacuum. Okay, and that is uh, shown here. So, the condenser actually operates in a vacuum which means that air if it leaks inside can actually get dissolved because of the high pressure. Okay? Uh, and that is not a good thing when um, we send the steam to the high pressure turbine or any of the other components because instead of having pure water, it is going to have pure water plus dissolved gases which is which will affect the performance, adversely affect the performance of all these components turbine and so on. So, there is usually a component known as deaerator where we bring the pressure closer to atmospheric pressure and then let the dissolved gases come out and then the water is then circulated uh, in the uh, in the flow circuit. Okay? So, that is the purpose of the deaerator. Okay? You can also notice that the uh, boiler has uh, various sections. Okay? The economizer is, a, is an initial section which is used for um, uh, raising the temperature of the water. And then we have what is uh, a section of the boiler called evaporator where the uh, liquid water and the condenser uh, pressure and temperature is converted to a vapor. This is then taken to a superheater here, superheater section of the boiler. And the superheated steam, this we have marked as state 1 in our cycle diagram. This superheated steam is then taken to the high pressure turbine. So, after expansion from the high pressure turbine, part of the steam is taken to, as you can see here, part of the steam is taken to the feed water heater, and the rest is then taken to the reheat section of the boiler just as we explained and the reheated steam is then taken to the intermediate pressure turbine. Notice that the intermediate pressure turbine has expansion uh, going axially outwards from the middle. Okay? This is very beneficial from a mechanical balancing perspective because the net force on the turbine rotor is, is 0 because you have expansion taking place in opposite directions. So, balancing the turbine rotor becomes uh, relatively easy. So, expansion takes place in this and then as you can see after the steam undergoes expansion in the intermediate pressure turbine, it is then taken to the low pressure turbine where it undergoes further expansion. And part of the steam as you can see here is extracted from the uh, low pressure turbine and sent to another. So, this is the blood steam which is then sent to another feed water heater. This is at a lower pressure. So, this uh, design or layout utilizes two feed water heaters and three turbines. And you can also see that uh, the this is the feed water that comes from the uh, low pressure turbine and cooling water is circulated separately in this circuit here. Okay. The cooling water does not mix with the uh, uh, condensate from the low pressure turbine because the condenser is operating in a vacuum. Okay. So, the cooling water uh, is, um, uh, is taken from the cooling tower 
uh, usually it is taken from uh, a nearby river or pond or lake and it is used to uh, cool the water in the condenser. So, this uh, uh, coolant is what is actually used to reduce the uh, temperature of take of the condensate from state 4 s to state 5. So, the flow rate of the cooling water is adjusted so that the condensate which enters the condenser leaves as a saturated liquid. Okay. So, that is how the flow rate is adjusted and this water is then actually cooled back to ambient temperature. It gets heated up to temperatures perhaps around uh, 45, 50 degree Celsius or so and it is then uh, cooled uh, in the cooling tower before being brought back. So, you can see that all the components that are shown um, in this uh, layout of a practical 1 gigawatt thermal power plant correspond exactly with what we have seen so far including the pressures and temperatures. Notice that this condenser also operates at 45 degrees Celsius and the pressures temperatures are all very, uh, very similar to what we have seen so far. Okay. So, whatever um, uh, knowledge and understanding that you have gained uh, from this discussion so far, you should be able to use easily to analyze a uh, power station like this, practical power station like this. The only component that we have not seen so far is the cooling tower and this is something that we will uh, discuss in the module on psychrometry, uh, operation of the cooling tower and how the uh, uh, water management in the cooling tower is carried out to accomplish this uh, purpose of cooling the condensate. Okay. And again, uh, once again let me emphasize that this was the uh, main objective of the course to translate ideas that you learnt in the first level course to practical applications and see what the uh, practical difficulties are, uh, difficulties in implementation. We can have any uh, Rankine cycle between any two pressures, any high temperature. But when you uh, have certain performance, uh, realistic performance parameters like specific power, first law efficiency, second law efficiency and you want an optimal design uh, that gives optimal values for all these three parameters, then many variations. So, yeah, we started with the basic Rankine cycle and then we went through many variations each of each one of which accomplished a certain objective as you can see here. Okay. So, that is the primary objective of the course to take remember all the uh, basic uh, concepts that you need to know to do this analysis were developed earlier except for the uh, notion of exergy and rate of exergy destruction and so on. All the other ideas were developed in the previous course um, applying you know uh, steady flow energy equation to each one of the components calculating the thermal efficiency and so on. All these were uh, learnt earlier. Now, a modern power plant actually uh, operates at pressures higher than uh, critical pressure as I mentioned earlier. So, a typical supercritical uh, cycle diagram for a supercritical power plant would look like this. So, the condensate, liquid condensate is pumped to a, a supercritical pressure and because this pressure and temperature, so this has peak temperatures around 600 degrees Celsius because this pressure and temperatures are so high, it is uh, uh, customary to have three uh, uh, turbines in uh, this type of layout, uh, high, uh, high pressure turbine, an intermediate pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. Okay. With the different, uh, with multiple numbers of feed water heaters. Okay. So, uh, a supercritical power plant is one in which the boiler pressure is greater than 221 bar, but less than 300 bar. So, 221 bar is the uh, critical pressure of water uh, greater than 221, but less than 300. Okay. Whereas, an ultra supercritical power plant, which is what is being uh, used, which is current state of the art has pressures 300 bar or higher. So, one is limited only by the metallurgy of uh, the um, uh, boiler material okay. because the thermal loads are very high. Uh, this has utilization factors approaching 100, the thermal loads are very, very high. So, only metallurgical limitations prevent us from increasing these values even more. And typical efficiencies uh, for supercritical would be around 50 percent and for this uh, ultra supercritical it is around 55 percent. Okay. For a peak temperature of 600 and a condensed temperature of 45 degree Celsius, <coughs> you can work out the Carnot efficiency and then see how well it compares with this. You will see that the these values of efficiency are not actually that far away from the Carnot efficiency. 
So, we are actually operating at uh, very very high efficiencies in uh, thermal plants today with ultra supercritical technology. The next uh, topic that we will uh, take up is uh, air standard cycle. Air standard cycle differs from uh, both the uh, Rankine cycle as well as the vapor compression cycle in certain important ways. We will discuss this and uh, in the next uh, lecture and then uh, consider three air standard cycles, Brayton cycle, Otto cycle which is representative of a spark ignition internal combustion engine and diesel cycle which is representative of uh, uh, compression ignition diesel engine.